All right. Welcome back, class, uh, to today's session uh, that looks at customer satisfaction. I mean, obviously, uh, the last session we looked at segmentation and how crucial segmentation is you know, in, in financial services where you've got to identify that different markets will require different financial services and products. And as a result, you know, target you know, the offering or the uh, financial services offering to these customers you know, in order that you know they can continually or uh, continuously actually purchase or you know purchase the financial services that you provide. Now today we are looking at satisfaction, and satisfaction is also very very important in marketing and most especially in financial services. Why? Because when it comes to financial services, it bothers on people's welfare because if you have to give financial statement, for example, that is not right, you could actually. Uh, be affecting somebody's you know uh, welfare uh, people can even get heart attack <laughs> seeing the wrong figures in their financial statement so financial you know uh, satisfaction of financial services is very very crucial and very paramount because of the role financial services actually play in people's livelihood so t this session we're going to look at you know how quality of services that we provide you know, it's critical to the requirement of business successes, etc. Okay, as usual, that's the session outline. And then the recommended list. And also, like we said, the importance of services quality or service quality management in financial services. You know, and we look at the quality in financial services directly linked to consumer welfare, as, as I said earlier. You know, bad financial advice, incorrect monthly bank balance, fund transfers that are lost in the wiring process, online brokerage account which is intruded through the internet. And then crucially we looked at the, the issue of standardization as a way of enhancing or as a way of ensuring quality of service. Now the reason why you know, uh, standardization is crucial is that if we leave, because of the service characteristics of financial services, if we have to leave you know, the processes of providing services to the hands or the judgment of service providers or staff or the workforce, then of course you're going to have a lot of variations you know, because obviously people's understanding, people's comprehension, people's skill set are entirely different from one person to the other. So there's the need for us ensuring you know, that the processes that we use to prov provide financial services one way or the other standardized so that the service variations wouldn't be that, that deep. Of course, we're not saying that you can achieve the total standardized services, but we know that if there are some laid out procedures that people have to follow in terms of providing financial services, then of course, we can ensure some level of high quality. So to what extent are we able to standardize the service provision so that from one staff to the other, we can maintain same standard or even enhance the quality of service provided. Of course, we say that one of the areas that is higher, you know, is high in financial services about, or not area, but one of the issues is about inertia. We have said that financial, consumers of financial services experience high level of inertia because, you know, they can't be bothered, you know, moving from one financial services to the other. Most especially because people's understanding of financial services is very low. And when people's understanding is very low, they sort of entrust you know, everything to the hands of the service provider. So they find it difficult moving from one end to the other, which means the barriers of exit is very high. But what we have seen in recent years is that the inertia is actually reducing. Why? Because there are so many kind of services, uh, service providers in the market so far I mean, for now, we can talk about 20 plus, you know, banks in Ghana, for example. We have so many savings and loans. We have so many microfinances. We have so many other non-banking financial service providers, which means the market is becoming very competitive. Customers are becoming much more aware of their financial rights or financial services rights. Consumers are becoming much more aware generally about the market. And so, therefore, they would take action in one way or the other. So we see a decreasing inertia in the market. And if there's a decreasing inertia, then it means that we are likely, we are most likely 
you know, going to experience switch. You know, people are going to switch from one financial service provider to the other, you know, more than what we used to know. So the competition is becoming much more intense. And then we have the regulation has become, or there's an increased level of, you know, switching due to more choices because of regulatory framework. The sector had been deregulated, more competition introduced. So therefore, we're, we are seeing switching taking place more. Obviously, decreased level of switching due to one-stop banking. Again, there's another argument that because most of the banks are actually offering kind of a, uh, one, one umbrella for most services, people are most likely to stay at one place because then whatever they need could be actually provided by one supplier. So if it's insurance, they probably can get it from their bank. You know, if it's about investment product, they don't actually need to go to an investment broker, they can get it from their bank. If it is about banking services, they can get it. Even some people can still get their traveling arrangement done by the bank. So we're saying that on one breath, although we're saying there's a high level of switching as a result of competition, as a result of uh, people becoming much more aware. We're also saying that increasingly people are also choosing to be where they are because the service provider may be one un umbrella, you know, given every other services that they require in terms of financial services. So we can actually look at those things as well as some of the development in the market. Now, the drivers of quality uh, perceptions in financial services, and remember, we say quality perception because the financial services character, the service character is such that quality may lie in the person's, you know, uh, uh, what do you call eyes. What is quality, we cannot measure it. I mean, we cannot say it's standardized or we cannot objectively say it is so. So it's always about perceived quality. It's always about perception. What somebody, you know, feels is of quality would differ from another person because of individual experiences. If somebody has actually been banking with one or two banks, their perception about quality is different from the person who has been banking with one because the person then don't have any measure at all to actually say that it's of quality or not. So it would differ in their perspective. So quality is always measured in perception terms. But then also we have the, these are the construct. We said objective performance of the product or services is one dimension. Human interaction with a customer is another. Company name and image is another dimension. That informs perceptions of quality. So what is the standard, you know, that the product is actually, the performance is actually, you know, being measured? And then, of course, what's kind of the interaction between the staff and the customers, the engagement level, their responsiveness, how responsive are staff to the customer, you know, how ready are they in responding to customers' needs, you know, how quick are they to actually assume ownership, you know, and how quick are they in delivering the service itself. So all those touch points actually come as part of the perception levels. And then the company name and image, you know, for how long has this company existed in the market and as a result informing or you know, informing people's perception about them as a genuine, you know, partner to, to, to do business with. They all go into, you know, the company name and image, their corporate brand, and then as a result affect people's perceptions, you know, of them as quality. So we can actually get satisfaction from these uh, model from this particular model, the disconfirmation model, or the expectancy disconfirmation model. We're saying that for for us to say somebody is satisfied, we always want to minus, you know, the expectation from performance, because expectation is what you come in first with. You expect something to be done, but then when the actual has happened, that is when the company has actually performed, we look at your level of expectation minus or your your the perform the actual performance minus your expectation level to see whether the company has you know performed or has you know achieved satisfaction in regard to the customer so assuming that the expectation was about you know uh, say eight percent and then the performance actual performance was about ten percent then of course when you minus the expectation from the performance uh, you know that the company has achieved but one is a negative figure, and then the company has actually, uh, uh, what do you call, underachieved in terms of performance. So you look at this this way. This confirmation equals performance minus expectation. So the greater the disconfirmation, the greater 
the shift in consumer satisfaction levels. Now, customer satisfaction information in financial services. Again, how do we form you know, satisfaction is the attribute expectation. So for some attributes, consumers have very specific expectations. For others, we don't, you know. So if you look at a waiting time, of course, per your engagement or per our experience with a bank or with a financial service provider over time, we are likely to come to a conclusion that yes, if I go to the bank at such and such time, I know there's gonna be a queue, and I know it's likely to be about 10 minutes. You know, if I go to the bank maybe at later in the day, I know there's not gonna be a queue, and therefore I'm gonna spend like, let's say two minutes there. So we have set, we have some kind of set expectation, you know, of how long we're gonna be in a banking hall, depending, you know, or based on our experiences with them. Then of course, behavior of the customer service helpline, again, we have some set expectations for them or some specific expectation. Again, the level of engagement with them might have actually informed our understanding how long or how we're gonna be treated on the phone. And then the date when our bank statement arrives, obviously it's a set date, so we always know. What we can't really expect or what we don't have ex uh, specified or specific expectations for it is, for example, charges. For example, if you actually default on your payment and you don't know when you're gonna default and what kind of default is gonna be, you know, the bank can come out with a particular charge that you are not aware of, so we don't have expectations for that. We may have certain expectations for some charges, but not all charges. The number of pages your bank statement is gonna be, again, we can't actually tell because it depends on the number of transactions you're gonna carry within the month and you don't know, you know, you can't set your transaction level. So again, we cannot expect how many pages your bank statement is going to be. Sometimes you can have bank statement about 10, and you really can't tell whether you have to read through all of them and things like that. So direct withdrawal of funds by banks own credit card company. This one doesn't happen here because most people don't have credit cards. But elsewhere, when you refuse to pay your credit card, there are certain agreements, you know, with some bank cards that actually says that if you fail to pay at a certain date, the bank can actually take the money directly from your account without you authorizing it. So again, that's something that people actually can't expect, you know, from the set time. So example of the expectancy disconfirmation model, like we said, it's about what uh, performance minus expectation, and that's, that's what it actually says here. So you expect one minute, sorry, you expect one minute and then the actual performance is one minute, definitely there is no impact because that's what you expect, that's what you get. However, when you expect 10 minutes and the performance is one minute, wow, you'll be asking yourself, where did you sleep tonight, last night? <laughs> and then you get delighted, absolutely. So that's the expectancy disconfirmation model there. So known effect of customer satisfaction practices on business performance, obviously we know. When you have high expect, uh, I mean, high satisfaction levels, you know that it becomes like a barrier to competition because then people are not ready to listen to the competitors because they're already satisfied or delighted. So once they approach by competition, they say, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm sorry, I'm very happy with my service provider. Sorry, thanks very much anyway for trying." That's what we do. That's the attitude. So whenever there is a high expect, I mean, there's a high satisfaction levels, people tend to have selective you know, attention. They, they don't want to hear any other alternative they're satisfied because they don't want to be you know, kind of um, uh, misguided in, the, in their thoughts. And then of course, positive word of mouth. I mean, when people are highly satisfied, you expect that they talk about their experiences with their friends, families, and then it goes on and goes on. So we know the effect that you know, satisfaction has on business performance. People become price insensitive because obviously, because they're getting what they think is the right service, they don't mind paying a little bit more you know, in order to get the same level of service or even to enhance it. So some reasons for the low complaint rates in financial services. We're saying that when the financial services is not getting complaint, doesn't mean that you know, people are very, very happy you know, with, with the level of service. But of course, if, if the company is also getting more complaint, it means that the people with the company or the financial services are happy with them 
and that's why they actually complain they want some things to be fixed not extremely happy but they they're happy to deal with you but they want certain things to be fixed so we say the self-attribution when customer blames themselves or herself for the bad experience you're not likely to get a lot of complaint because they think that it's their fault that a particular service hadn't worked so you hear people asking or oh, maybe i didn't actually apply to the to the you know to the required use or maybe i didn't read the guidelines or i didn't do this i didn't do that so people sort of self blame themselves they, they sort of apportion blame to themselves and therefore may not necessarily complain which means that every company especially financial services must be proactive in finding out from customers whether they are happy or they are okay with the kind of services they are getting or with a particular use of product or services so that they will be able to find out whether people are not complaining not because they don't want to complain but just because they are not coming up forward and so people have to be very very proactive companies have to be very proactive in seeking complaint because there are people who won't come back to you you know to to say that something went wrong and for you to actually show them or teach them how to do it properly and then also to offer any other remedial kind of processes so it's good that companies become proactive in seeking complaint not know where or who to complain to yes the complaint procedure itself may be cumbersome as a result customers may not complain because they don't even know the hotline and even if they know the hotline because it's a hotline they have a perception that they're not going to get through or their complaint is going to be rubbished you know by the company so and then yeah distress caused by the complaining process just uh, just like i was saying and a lack of confidence in the financial institution's ability to respond to the complaint like i said when people actually think or expect that their complaints are not going to get anywhere that they're not going to get any desired response then of course they won't complain so these are some of the you know factors that actually go you know to to emphasize the low rate of complaint by you know uh, customers received by companies but that doesn't mean that people are satisfied entirely with your service so people have to companies have to proactively seek those complaints from customers approaches to customer satisfaction measurement so how do we you know measure satisfaction and we're saying that in in dealing with customers number of years that people have been with you can actually be a gauge you know you can actually tell that for so many years somebody has been with you naturally means perhaps they are satisfied with it but again it's not absolute you may have to seek to find out continually to find the opinions whether are they satisfied or just by inertia that they are with you the number of financial product that customers buy again when someone is happy the the assumption is that they will cross sell or they will cross buy you know they will up buy upscale their their purchases with you so and then they will introduce more friends or more relatives you know into the into the fray so we're saying that these are fairly good indicators to let us know that they are satisfied or they're not satisfied the reverse is if the person has to reduce the number of you know transactions with you maybe you know weekly and then it comes to daily you have to be uh, it comes to let's say one month every one month you have to be concerned why are they reducing the period within which or the period at which they actually transact businesses with you you've got to be very concerned about it satisfaction service again not only these observations but we can also survey customers to find out you know their satisfaction levels dimensions of customer satisfaction again these are some dimensions for us to know whether you know people are satisfied reliability you know the ability to provide what was promised dependably and accurately so if you ask people in service for example and then the reliability score is high then of course we know that there is a tendency that they are satisfied real responsiveness rate again could actually tell and then assurances empathy tangibles now how do people rate you along these lines if they rate you they rate you highly then it means it's likely that they are much more satisfied if you, they rate you very lowly then it means that you know you're doing very bad then we have a uh, improving customer satisfaction in financial services the gaps you know for you to improve services satisfaction then of course you want to look at the gaps and how you can actually fill those gaps so critical gaps may exist between actual and expected 
aspects of the service. So expected wait time for tele-service versus actual wait time. Now, the gap between this, you know, would actually tell you whether something must be done to enhance or to improve. Management specification of accepted wait times versus actual wait time. So what does management say is accepted and what is the actual? Again, it's a gap. Then actual wait time versus what consumers perceive to be the wait time. So again, it's a gap that you need to actually measure. Then service quality can be improved by reducing some of these gaps. Yeah. So gap analysis continue, like we said. So customer's actual service experience is based on company records. So you look at all these indicators and you'll be able to see the gaps and then actually fill them. So examples of financial services practices that foster customer satisfaction. Training is crucial so that you can actually kind of build the capacities of every staff to make sure that they achieve standardized performance or they can even enhance it. You know, complaint handling procedures, again, to what extent and how quick are you able to you know, handle complaint and how easy the process is, how smart your you know, staff are in you know, kind of expressing empathy you know, in, in, in complaint, complaint uh, what you call handling. How, do you, how, how good are you to reduce waiting times for con phone calls or you know, ATM networks, you know, working, how wide are they, and how reliable are they, 24-hour phone banking, parking space, etc. Allowing customers to request termination of telemarketing calls. Again, it goes to actually enhance your performance or satisfaction, because then if people think that it is difficult for them to even tell you not to call them, in terms of telemarketing, then of course it impacts on how they feel about you. Okay, so anchoring, you know, point for financial services marketing. So you have profit from a single customer multiplied by a number of customers, obviously that tells you the profit levels. So drivers of profitability, again, we're saying that customer satisfaction leads to profitability, and these are the drivers, you know, of profitability. So customer acquisition strategies are these advertising, price cutting, direct selling, co-branding, all these are ways of acquiring new customers. And then that leads to number of customers, profitability. And then customer retention strategies also lead to profitability. So how many products are there in the bundling kind of uh, you know, strategy? How many product or different kind of product are you able to bundle in order to lock up people or customers in the business? Loyalty programs, incentives that you have, cyclical timing, service retention protocols, complaint solicitation, personal contact, target marketing, that leads to average profit per customer and then profitability. So determining opt optimal cross-selling opportunities. And like we're saying, once you're actually performing, you're likely to, to cross-sell to customers because when they're satisfied, they're very happy to you know, keep other businesses with you. So you're able to cross-sell. And these are some of the indicators of cross-selling in a financial services, you know, that, that you sell maybe a bank, banking product as well as insurance product within a financial services. So customer sa satisfaction formation in financial services, again, continued. And we have said, inertia, you're more likely to change your spouse than to change your bank, obviously, elsewhere, you know, because then we're saying that people tend to not to be bothered about you know moving banks but of course we're saying that the the current regime is changing and therefore people are much more likely to change their financial services just like they change their spouse if that's the truth you know then performance again we have talked about that and then consumers departing with little advance notice so methods for strengthening customer relationship like we said satisfaction goes with relationship in as much as it goes with you know, what you call acquisitions. So we have all these bundling, individual catered incentives, cyclical timing, et cetera. So, yes, so that's the end of this session, customer satisfaction. Like we said, if you look at financial services, for example, more than any other service, it is about people's livelihood, it is about people's welfare. I mean, imagine sending a note, a, 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 what do you call, a, a loan letter, you know, about how much the person is left to pay. And you tell the person that, oh, you're left with 10,000 Ghana cities to pay, when in actual fact, the person is left with about 1,000. So extra zero can send the person to the grave because then he's going to scream and say, what? 
I thought I'm done with payment. You know, so that's how serious uh, satisfaction in financial services is and how tied it is to people's livelihood and welfare. So I think that is very, very crucial. Although in other marketing areas or in every, every marketing endeavor, customer satisfaction is important, but in financial services, it can actually have a tell on people's livelihood and people's welfare. Thank you.